and Lord of Lords. How many of you are here to seek that Jesus this weekend? Come on, make some noise. Are you here to seek this God of the universe? Welcome, welcome, United 2023. It's so good to be here with you. My name is Libin, and I'm so thankful to spend this weekend with you, just opening up God's Word. Where are all the middle schoolers at? All right, all right, right around here. Some, where's the high schoolers? All right, all right, I see, I see. High schoolers got a little bit more sound in them. Let's see by the end of the weekend. Middle schoolers, if you can catch up. Hey, it's so good to be with you again, and thank you. I'll give it up for your small group leaders, your HSM, MSM staff, and this worship team that's been leading you. Man, they're, they're incredible. Um, as I was thinking about my life, uh, especially when I was in middle school and high school, I was thinking about what was it that defined me as we're talking about being defined. And for me, there was two things particularly that I really lived for, and I felt like I was defined by. One, I was defined by the need to be a really good religious kid. I grew up in church. My parents were pastors, and so I really felt this incredible pressure to do the right things, to say the right words, to dress the right way. My dad was a pastor, so we were always the first to get there, last to leave. Had to show up in all of our competitions and win the memory verse competitions and all kinds of stuff. And I really felt like my definition was based on how much I prayed, how many rules I kept, how many good things I did, that that's what defined me. But the only problem was there were moments where I didn't keep the rules didn't feel like I did enough, and because my whole identity was built around this definition, it's what I do for God that makes me who I am, I began to experience an identity crisis, because I thought I was defined uh, by what I could do for God and what I brought to the table. The second thing that I really thought defined me was the need to impress people. I'm sure none of you deal with that, but I did. I got to impress people, make people like me. I remember particularly... Uh, I was towards the end of my high school year, and I had just met a few like college guys from out of town at a youth weekend, and they were coming into town for a wedding. And it was Friday night before the wedding, which was going to be on Saturday. I was like, man, I want to impress these like older guys. I want to, this is like the cool guys that I've always wanted to be around. And I noticed in the mirror, my hair was kind of shaggy, and it wasn't really cut. I was like, man, maybe I can give myself a haircut so I can impress these guys before the wedding tomorrow. You know, at that time, everyone's like shaving their sides and all that. I've like, seen my brother give himself a haircut. Maybe I can do the same for myself. So like 9 o'clock at night, I get into the bathroom, and I begin to go at it to give myself a haircut. And I do my sides, and man, it's looking good. I'm pretty impressed with myself. I go to do the top, and it's like, it's not as short as I wanted to be, so I keep digging in deeper. You already know where the story is going. So I go to where I get it to the length that I want it to be, and then I go shower and come out of the shower thinking I'm going to look fresh and clean. And I look in the mirror, I got a massive ball spot right here in the middle of my head. I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh, what do I do? There's no barbershop. I can't tell my family about this. This is going to be horrible. So here's what I did. Things you should never do. I picked up the cut hair from the trash can and started sprinkling it on top of my head, even using some double tape, double-sided tape to try to get it to stick to my head. I said, all right, I got this good enough. So the morning of, I'm like, if I just walk straight and tall... Don't bend over. Don't scoop down. If I just walk straight, no one will notice. Well, my mom had prepared this bowl of cereals, my favorite, Cinnamon Toast Crunch cereal. Anybody else like Cinnamon Toast Crunch? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. There you go. My kids are into Lucky Charms, but Cinnamon Toast was all there for me. I get to my first scoop, and all of my hair <laughs> falls down into my cereal. And my mom was like, what happened? I was like, I have no clue. My brother did it. And that's when I realized it's not worth trying to live to impress people. And oftentimes, it was the need to impress people that made me break some of the rules that I knew I shouldn't have broken. So I was often caught up in this definition of wanting to impress people, but yet trying to be a religious kid that was doing the right things because I really felt like that's what mattered the most. I like the definition of who I am, how I'm supposed to really live, and what it is that I'm supposed to live for. And this weekend, that's what I want to really talk to you about, the definition of who you are, how we live by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, which we'll be talking about tomorrow, and what is it that we're supposed to live for? What is the definition of our purpose that God has revealed 
to us. I believe I'm looking at some of the greatest generations in the world, Gen Z and below. I believe you're going to usher in one of the greatest moves of God that the world has ever seen. That there's an incredible purpose on your life. That as the world gets darker, that you are the generation that's going to point the light to Jesus and point people to the light of who he is, what he has done, and what he invites people to. There's an incredible purpose that the enemy wants to distract you from. Because if he can't destroy you, he wants to distract you. You are one of the greatest generations to ever lived. You're going to lead so many people to the truth of who Jesus is. There's an incredible purpose about you. So this week, we're going to tap into who we are, how we live, and what it is that we are to live for. Tonight, I want to a little bit talk through who is it that we are that God defines us to be. And I read the story a few years ago about these two brothers who were born and raised in Budapest, Hungary. Here's a picture of them. Their names are Zolt, and uh, the names are Zolt and, and, and Gezard. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Gold, uh, Zolt and Gezard. Their story, they were about 40 years of age, and when they were just a little kid, there were two little boys, when they were just kids, their dad dropped them off and abandoned them. And soon after, their dad passed away, and then soon after, their mom passed away. They didn't know anything about their parents. Most people didn't even know they lived. They didn't have an address. They lived homeless on the streets for many, many years, for nearly four decades. And the way they survived was they went from garbage can to garbage can, eating whatever they can from scraps. And as they got older, they tried to make a living by selling plastic and things that they found in recycle bins. This is how they lived for nearly four decades. They knew that their mom's mom was wealthy, but they didn't know anything about her, where she lived. So they spent four decades living on the streets, homeless, without an address, without anything to their name, living from garbage can to garbage can. And then, when they were in their 40s, their maternal grandmother, their mom's mom, died. And just a few years ago, their mom had also died. Their grandmother, their mom's mom, lived in Germany, and according to the law of Germany at that time, your inheritance had to be given to one of your relatives. Well, they realized, after they had been found, that their grandmother was the wealthiest woman in all of Europe. And so as the lawyers began to think about who do we give all this money that this lady has, they found out about these two guys and their sister who lived in America. So as they began to find out where they lived, they found these two guys, and they, they each inherited $2 billion. $2 billion. That's a lot of money. I don't know if you realize that's a lot of money. They overnight became some of the wealthiest people in the whole world simply because of who they were related to. I just wondered, I wish they had known who their grandmother was. I, I imagine she would have created a better life for them because this is family, and that's what family does. But here they are for four decades living homeless, living on the street, living from garbage can to garbage can simply because they lacked an understanding of who it is that they are. And oftentimes, I think we can go through a Christian life from relationship to relationship, person to person, hopes to hopes, dreams to dreams, trying to see what is it that fulfills and we come up empty. And oftentimes it's because we don't yet know the definition of who it is that we are, not to just somebody else, but who we are to God. Because there's a God who has made the whole universe, who sees you and he says to you, you are mine. I created you in my image. I gave up everything for you. You are mine, and everything I have is yours. There's an incredible danger in living without definition, without knowing who you are. And tonight, I want to just give you two words before you about the definition of who you are. What is it that defines you? That you are forgiven and you are free. Somebody say forgiven. forgiven. There's about 30% of you. Say it again. Forgiven. forgiven. And free. free. Forgiven. forgiven. 
and free. free. This is who you are in Christ. You are forgiven and free. I think this is an incredible balance or it's, it's two sides of the Christian life that we live forgiven lives and we live free lives. I've seen a lot of people who only live forgiven lives and have yet to live a free life. I saw a bumper sticker that said, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm forgiven. And the mentality is, hey, I'm forgiven, so I don't really care how I live. And I live this beggar mentality that I'll never be good enough, I'll never be perfect, but at least I'm forgiven. But that's not all that God has for you. Yes, he forgives you. He wipes your sins away. He gives you grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy. But he's not only interested in forgiving you. He wants you to live free. Forgiven and free. And there are others who will try to live free but have not experienced the power of forgiveness. So we'll try to perform We'll try to act right. We'll try and try and try. We'll put on our best. We'll go through all the self-help books. Some of them are great. But we try to achieve forgiveness apart from the grace of God that forgives. And we'll never be free apart from God's power that forgives. So the definition that God calls you into of who you are is that you are both. You are forgiven because of Jesus, of what he has done, who he is, and you are forgiven to live a free life, a life of liberty, a life of freedom. I want to take you to a passage of scripture that we talked about here on Sunday morning a few weeks ago in Ephesians 1. It's a part of scripture that spoke volumes to my heart when I was dealing with the need to be this kind of a kid and to impress others. I began to dive into Ephesians 1 and I began to realize who it is that God calls me to be. And more importantly, who he is to me already and who I am to him already. And what you'll see in some of the passages we read in Ephesians 1, you see this theme of forgiveness and freedom coming together really as one definition of who you are. Verse 3 of Ephesians 1 says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ for he chose us in him. Just think about that video you saw a few minutes ago. The God who made everything, the one who hung the star and the moon and put the galaxy where it is. The one that all of creation echoes his glory, the magnitude, the grandeur of God. That God chose you. He chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. Before any of that happened, he had you in mind. He saw your story. He saw your life. And he says, I want you to be mine. And I want everything of mine to be yours. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. In love before him. This is the definition of who you are to be to God, holy and blameless, forgiven and free before him, chosen before the foundation of the earth to be holy and blameless, forgiven and free. One of the most disappointing times in my life was when I was in eighth grade and I tried out for the basketball team. I didn't make it, just in case you're wondering. But what I remember more about the tryouts were two things. One, how it took me about a year to convince my dad to let me try out because Indian parents don't want their kids in sports. They want you to study all day long. My dad would literally yell at me when I came home with a 98, asking me where the other two points were. So that's the kind of home I grew up in. The second thing I remember about the tryouts was going into the tryout and those mean little eighth graders talking smack. They said, hey, the only reason you would ever get into the team is because you have good grades. And that could help the average of the GPA of the basketball team. I should have taken that as a compliment, but I didn't. Totally crushed me. And the second thing they said was they need more diversity in the basketball team. So that's the only reason you would ever get chosen or selected in this team. And those words lodged deep into my heart, into my mind. And it defined me. And guess what? Before even the tryouts, I was already doomed from the start. I had no confidence, no sense of I could actually do this. And I played the worst game ever, and I wasn't selected. 
Now, I would love to tell you that I was like MJ and Michael Jordan who didn't make the eighth grade or whatever middle school team and then became an all-star, but the reality is I never really got any better, all right? I never made any, I was playing some ball this last week and sprained my, my knee again. But I was thinking about how those words impacted me, but I was thinking, what if had the coach come up to me before the tryout and said, hey, we want you to try out, but you're not playing to be selected because we've already chosen you. We've seen you. We know who you are, and we believe you are the best choice for our team. You bring something incredibly valuable. We have already chosen you. So yes, try out, but have fun because you're not playing to be selected. You're playing because you're already chosen. Man, if if that was the mindset I had, I would have walked in there with so much power and confidence and joy and had a total different game. So Paul says, the God of the universe, before you were even born, before you could ever prove yourself to him, show him what you could do, your skills, your talents, your gifts, before the foundation of the earth were laid, he looked through the timeline of history, and he says to you, you don't need to try to be selected, you're already chosen. You don't have to try to be selected based on what you can do, you're already chosen based on what my son has done. You have been chosen before time even began. And later on, Paul will say that God has adopted you, he has redeemed you, he has chosen you with full wisdom and understanding. Like there were no surprises to your story that he didn't know. He chose you, he saw you, he chose to save you with full wisdom and full understanding. He saw your best day and your worst, your greatest wins and your failures. He saw your mistake, he saw your addiction, he saw how many times you would break that promise to others, to him, to your parents, to your best friend. He saw all of that and he said, with full assurance, with full wisdom, with full understanding, I still want you. And your God doesn't have buyer's remorse. He doesn't have regrets about the people he chooses and the people he saves. With full wisdom and understanding, he chose you to be forgiven and free, to be holy and blameless. Some of you are thinking, I could never live that kind of a life, a life that's both forgiven and free. I could never live a life that's holy and blameless. But here's the reality. God has more faith in you than you have in him. The things that you never believe that you can do or the kind of life you never believe that you could live, God believes you can. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent his son. Otherwise, he would not have sent his Holy Spirit. And he knows you can't do it on your own. So he gives you his very power, his very spirit to live inside of you so that you can live his life through you. Some of you need to hear tonight that what matters more than your faith in him is his faith in you. It's his commitment to you, his unwavering love and commitment and loyalty to you. He chose you before you could ever choose him. But here's the deal. For you to be chosen in him, Jesus had to volunteer. For you to be chosen in him to be holy and blameless, someone had to make you holy and blameless. And Jesus said, I'll do it. Notice 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, where Peter writes, For you know that you were not redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Exact same phrase that Paul uses in Ephesians 1 about how God saw you before the foundation of the world and chose you to be holy and blameless. And Peter says, well, the moment you were chosen in God to be holy and blameless, Christ volunteered and was foreknown before the foundation of the world to be the sacrifice that would pay the penalty, the price of your sin and my sin. So here's the reality. The father said, I want to choose these people. I want to save them. I want to give them a forgiven life. I want to give them a free life. And the son said, you can't do that without me. Because we're holy. And humanity is unholy. Humanity is in bondage to sin. So the son said, I'll go. 
I'll offer my life. I'll offer my righteousness. Because as much as they try to be holy, they won't make it. As this much as they can be religious and do the right things and no matter how many thousands of animal sacrifices they offer, how many good things they do, it'll never be enough. So the only way for them to be holy and righteous is for my perfect record to stand on their behalf. So if you're choosing people, then I'm volunteering to be the perfect sacrifice. That's exactly what Jesus did. He became the price that we couldn't pay the sacrifice we could never muster up or offer on our own. And he would lay down his life so that you and I could be saved, so that you and I could be both forgiven and so that we could be free. This term, to be holy and blameless, speaks of a total reversal of the effects of sin. It is holiness from the inside, your position of holiness in Jesus because of the perfect record of Jesus now coming through you for you to live a blameless life in love before God. It is your position of holiness causing you to live a practice of freedom. That you are free in Christ and you live a free life. No longer broken but whole in Jesus. No longer addicted but whole and alive and free in Jesus. You would be marked no longer as a sinner, but as a saint, washed by his blood, empowered by his spirit. And this position of freedom will lead us to a life of freedom, a practice of freedom. Because whom the Son has set free is free indeed. As I was praying for tonight, I just really sensed it in my heart that a lot of you are thankful to be forgiven. But you have embraced a life that's not free. And this weekend, God's desire for you is that you will move from forgiveness to freedom. From the very very patterns and habits that still enslave you, there will be an absolute freedom in Jesus Christ because he saw you from the beginning of time and he said, I'm going to give you everything you need to be holy and blameless. I'm offering you my son so that nothing should keep you from this kind of a life that defines you a life that is forgiven And free. Paul goes on in Ephesians 1, verse 5 to 6. He says, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He didn't have to do this. No, this was the pleasure of his will. So you're adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. Why? To the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. More than the stars could sing out of praise to God, you who have been adopted by God into his family to the praise of his glorious grace, your song matters more to God. That's why moments like worship that we have this weekend, it matters because you were chosen, adopted by God to the praise of his glory. So God, I believe silence is even the choir of angels to hear the singing of those who are forgiven and free. For those who have been adopted to the praise of his glorious grace because this was the pleasure of your heavenly father. There's a ton of things we look at and find pleasure in. A whole lot of things we look at and say, wow, that's amazing. But the father looks at your life that's forgiven and free and he says, wow, that's what I've always wanted. That's what I created them for. That's why I gave my son and my spirit for, so they can be forgiven and free. This was the pleasure of his will. The father adoring you, loving you, cherishing you. And it is our life being lived for the praise of his glory. Throughout my middle age, uh, my middle school years, I was trying to become a son, thinking I could achieve my sonship trying to become a son. How crazy does that sound? Imagine if my little three-year-old boy tried every day to become my son. And I realized, no, I can't achieve my sonship, but I can only receive it by grace. Maybe you're here trying to be selected, trying to become a son or a daughter, and God is saying you can't achieve it, but you can receive it. It's a status change. It's an identity change. You can receive it by grace. 
It's what I offered my son for so that in exchange of his life, you get to be adopted. You get to be brought in and made the very family of God. You receive it by faith, by grace. I don't know what your family background is. I don't know what kind of family you come from. I know some of you. You could have a perfect family, a great dad and a mom and a perfect puppy. Or your life could be the farthest from that, broken and hostile. And you don't even want to go home. But here's the beautiful thing. You have a perfect heavenly father who says, I have brought you into a new family. And in God's family, you don't have to be afraid. Because in his family, you're accepted. You're accepted in the beloved. And he looks at you with the same favor and delight that he looks at Jesus with. He loves you with the same love he loves his only begotten son. You belong. No matter your story, no matter your struggle, no matter your sin, no matter your past or present, no matter your future, you belong in a new family. And he's perfect. When I pick up my son from school or daycare, he runs up to me and says, Daddy, there's no fear in that. I heard in my spirit that this weekend, some of you will cry out, Abba, Father, for the first time without fear. Some of you will be coming to a place of a new birth just as an infant in a delivery room has a first cry. Your first cry will be, Abba, Daddy, Heavenly Father, because you will realize why you have been brought in, adopted, brought in by grace as a child of God. The amazing thing is you don't just belong to a family with God, you belong to a family with one another. So as you have conversations with your small group leaders and with pastors and with staff members, you belong in this family. This might be your first time at United, but you already belong. You already belong into this amazing family of God. Paul goes on in verse 7, and he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Here's the word forgiveness. According not to your worthiness to be forgiven, not to your ability to achieve forgiveness, earn it. No, no, no. According to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ. You have been redeemed and forgiven, forgiven and free because a price was paid. The word redeemed simply means deliverance by the payment of a ransom. And a ransom was an actual cost that somebody that was related to the slave or a prisoner would have to come and pay a price. And if that price was good enough, that prisoner or that slave could be freed. But they weren't just freed. Every debt was released and forgiven. They were forgiven and free. Can I get a volunteer, one of the guys in the front? Could you help me out here? Come on, don't be ashamed. I won't hurt you. What's up, man? Chase, is that your name? Jake. Jake. Yeah. Good to meet you, man. Paul says you are redeemed and forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. Because the reality was prior to Jesus, could you put your hands out, both of them? Prior to Jesus, all of humanity was in bondage. Bondage to sin, bondage to ourselves, and bondage to Satan. There was no way we could find freedom. No matter how good you were, I was, no matter how much we impressed other people, no, no, we were in bondage. And if you try to give everything you could, the payment still was not sufficient. And the reality of being in bondage is you got to go wherever he who owns you goes. The Bible talks about us being Children of wrath, of disobedience, of the enemy, Satan owning us. We had no willpower in our own, no ability on our own to find freedom. This was the condition of all humanity, and so many still live enslaved and in chains. But Jesus entered our story. 
Jesus would say it like this in Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for Many, there's the same word, as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I'm going to pay the price because no matter how hard you try, you can't pay it. You can't borrow enough. So here's my perfect life. Here's my sinless life. And he who knew no sin, he who did no sin became sin. He took all of it on so that one by one he would break open the shackles of the enemy and find freedom. Did you put your hands again? But yet the reality for many, Jesus has loosened the chains. But we may still live burdened by patterns and habits that are destructive. Guilt and shame that are plaguing our hearts. Forgiven, yes, the connections are broken, we're loosed, but still carrying the weight. Still listening to the lie of the enemy that you can never be free. I think about that moment when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus. And he said, Lazarus, come out. Just one word, Lazarus, a dead person, came alive. But you know what he was covered in? The Bible says he was covered in grave clothes. He was alive, but still in grave clothes. And Jesus said to Lazarus' friends, because that's was his community, do y'all go and take off his grave clothes? For some of you this weekend, as you have small group time, as you have moments with your small group leader and staff, is a spirit working through them to take off your grave clothes. To help you see, no, you are free. You don't have to live under the weight of your shackles. You are free in Christ because you've been forgiven by grace, you can actually live free. Give it up, Jake. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate it, Jake. But here's the deal. Living forgiven and living free is not about trying. It's about trusting. Living Forgiven and living free is not about trying. The goal isn't for you to leave tonight and just try harder. I gotta live free. Gotta break the patterns and the habits and the addictions and not go to that website anymore and not see that. No, no, it's not about trying. It's about trusting. Do you trust that Christ is enough for you? Do you trust that his spirit has been given to you? Will you trust in his perfect record that removes guilt and shame? And as you trust in him one degree more, you'll experience freedom one degree more. In your moment of weakness, you rely on him, you trust in him, you go to Jesus, you put your eyes on him who is the freedom giver. And you'll experience his freedom. It's not about trying harder. It's about trusting, trusting in Jesus, trusting in his spirit. Say, God, I'm weak in this moment. I trust you to be my power because I can muster this power. I guarantee you the Spirit will empower you. He will strengthen you. There's been a lot of things that have been a part of your definition, but they don't define you anymore. A lot of things that has been a part of your definition, but they don't define you. Maybe as you look back in the rearview mirror of your life in your past, maybe addiction was a part of your definition. Maybe abuse was part of your definition. Pornography, a part of your definition. Being taken advantage of. Substance abuse. Self-harm. Broken home. Whatever has been a part of your definition does not have to define you. Because there's a God who saw you before he made the world and he defined you. He spoke a word over you. Will you take him ahead as his word? Or like me in eighth grade, will you take the words of those around you? The words of your experience that tells you you're not gonna ever be free. The words of classmates and exes that tells you you're not worth it. 
Whose word will you take? God's word over you is that you are chosen to be forgiven and free. You stand on your feet tonight. You can't be selected based on what you do. You can be chosen, though, based on what Jesus has done. If you're living forgiven but not free tonight, the Lord is reminding you of the freedom you already have. But for some of you, you've been trying to be free, but you haven't been forgiven because you haven't placed your faith in Christ. And this weekend, the Holy Spirit is working on your heart. He's moving in your heart. He's whispering to your soul. He's giving you a nudge. He's giving you a prompting, an impression to place your faith, your confidence, your trust fully in Jesus, to put all your weight on him. To hear the word of the Father that says you are forgiven and you are free. Forgiven of your past and free of its pattern, its addiction, its power. So Father, here we are. God, I thank you that you saw this moment before even the foundation of this world. You saw this moment and you saw this to be the moment where they would realize that some in this room would realize that they can be forgiven, that they have been forgiven, that they can be free, or that they have been freed. So against the lies of the enemy that will convince us that we are still enchained, there are some tonight who are exchanging a spirit of slavery for the spirit of sonship and a spirit of daughtership. A spirit of being adopted into the family of God, the spirit of sonship and daughtership that can't be achieved but can be freely received. Because the moment we were chosen in the heart of God, Jesus volunteered to go to the cross to get us out of the way, and then He would stand in our place, absorbing the full wrath that we were owed. So that not only would we be, be forgiven that we would be free. So I thank you for this generation that's going to live both of those truths out. Forgiven by the grace of God, accepted in the beloved, full of grace, and free to live the life that you have defined for them by the power of your spirit to live. Because this is the firm foundation. Your word is our firm foundation. Jesus, you are our firm foundation, so nothing else will do and you won't fail us. You are loyal. You are committed. You are faithful. In our faithlessness, you are faithful. So we put our eyes on the one who is more faithful than we could ever be. Jesus, the hope of glory. Thank you that we are forgiven and we are free. Would you give Jesus a clap offering of praise and let's continue to worship tonight to the praise of his glorious grace.